the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Gospel tells us that immediately after being baptized in the Jordan River by John, Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. When we started the service and the choir started wandering around you, you probably thought you too were in the wilderness. <laughs> we do that as a way in this beginning of a Lenten season that it essentially blesses the temple. It blesses our space. We gather together. Since we're Episcopalians, we need to be reminded right off the bat that being driven into the wilderness isn't the same thing as what was happening to Jesus. We might even believe that it's kind of like driving to Jordan Lake for a camping weekend when we can take a leisurely walk down the waterfront or talk and take a walk in a wooded path and commune with the Almighty. Not quite. Now, that may seem obvious on some level, but still in this day and age when people spend hundreds of dollars to have one form or another of wilderness experience, it's important to ensure that we don't confuse the idealistic pastoral retreat with what Jesus experienced because they're vastly different. The Trappist monk Thomas Merton once quipped, half cynically, about the modern spiritual experience. He writes, Alas, in America, there is no wilderness, only dude ranches. Although I've never been there, those who have told me about their Judean wilderness experience and find it to be a terrible place. Apparently, the landscape is dotted with dangerous ravines and outcroppings. And everywhere you go, the ground is covered with sharp stones that can be felt right through your hiking boots. There is virtually no vegetation there, so a person can wander around lost for miles because one spot looks like every other spot. Just one big, barren wasteland. All throughout scripture, the wilderness was a powerful symbol of the historical turmoil that Israel was struggling through its own way to become a nation and in its relationship with God. It represented the worst of times and conditions for the Jewish people, the terrible testing ground that God has led them through on the way to the promised land. As a theological symbol, the wilderness represents turmoil and confusion, uncertainty, fear, disorientation, and just plain being lost. It was not a place that most people would choose to visit, unless you happen to be on a tourist visiting the Holy Land. But then again, you had a guide. But if you want to understand the wilderness, you don't have to take a trip to the Middle East or anywhere. It's just as possible to experience the wilderness in your very own living room. Have you ever wandered through the wilderness of the living room? I don't mean literally, you know, like you can't find your way to the sofa or the coffee table. I'm talking about those occasions when we have from time to time when the most familiar surroundings suddenly become alien territory and we feel like strangers in our own house. I wonder if you Remember such an occasion in your own life when you're going about your business without a care in the world, comfortable in your surroundings and enjoying your routine, and then in a shockingly short time, everything changed. Suddenly the telephone rings or you get a letter or someone knocks on your door and instantly the landscape is altered. A loved one has died or someone's in trouble or you received a scary diagnosis, or you've learned that a critical business deal has fallen through. 
And after any such experience, you walk around the house like you've never seen the place before. The familiar is bleak, barren, unwelcoming, and even hostile. The peaceable kingdom of everyday life has become a terrible wilderness, and you are wandering in your own living room. Whether wandering across the Judean landscape as Jesus did or wandering across the living room floor, the dynamics are the same. One experiences disorientation, confusion, uncertainty, loneliness, and fear. What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I call? Staring at the unrecognizable features of our lives, we begin to feel a wave of desperation welling up inside of us. Then suddenly, our brains start dreaming up one crazy plan after another. In the wilderness of the living room, rationality gives way to panic, and there in the real temptation do anything to repel the pain that is closing in. So much of the time, we associate temptation with simple indulgences that we encounter in our day-to-day lives, like an extra chocolate donut when we're supposed to be dieting, or one more drink when we vow to give it up for Lent. But temptation, from the biblical perspective, is much more powerful and potentially destructive force than the magnetic pull of simple indulgence. According to Mark, the devil visits us when we are most vulnerable. It's precisely when we are afraid or alone and desperate that the devil introduces some ungodly options, easy outs, and dishonest solutions for stemming the tide of our pain. And in the midst of fear and desperation, we start to look for bad choices. Many a lost hiker has died in the wilderness because out of fear or desperation or disorientation, they strayed off on some path and became even more lost and wandered into even greater danger. Now God knew that there would be times for Jesus in his life, just like there would be times for us when the familiar would become strange and Jesus would find himself under attack by unseen predators. And so, in preparation for this, God sent Jesus out for a field test to learn what sort of survival kit he would need and what sort of essential equipment to endure his journey. So what might Jesus have discovered would be needed in his field kit? The first is simply having a relationship and having spiritual friends to turn to. If you've ever been lost in the woods by yourself, even for a moment, the first thing that grips you is that you're all alone. And when you're by yourself, all the dangers of the wilderness are magnified and exaggerated, and that's when you start to make bad decisions. Interestingly, in Mark's gospel, after the 40 days are over, Jesus immediately goes out and calls the disciples to follow him. While in the wilderness, our Savior learned well the value of having other people in his life. People that he could rely on. People he could trust. And people he could share his journey with. And so for the rest of his ministry, he always had people around him close at hand. Jesus understood the value of community that life cannot be lived nor ministry ever pursued in isolation. And so a spiritual friendship is the first piece of essential equipment we should place in our own wilderness survival kit. Somebody to talk to, pray with, or just to be there. In the South, especially in the South, 
There is this unwritten rule that says people should keep their problems to themselves and handle things on their own, that it's wrong or bad to turn to others for help. Anyone want to disagree? Texas. I was taught, and maybe you were too, that stoic isolation is the proper method for surviving the wilderness. But I believe that is exactly what the devil wants us to do. He knows how to appeal to our egos. I believe it suits Satan just fine when we are kept apart from one another. It's the old divide and conquer routine. Many of us are blessed with close relationships and friends, an understanding spouse or a parent that we can turn to when the wilderness begins to close in on us. But lots of us don't have that kind of support, or what support we do may not just be enough. Each one of us would do well to become part of a group of Christians who come together to study for prayer or support. To be all alone in the wilderness is terrifying. A companion who can be there to give encouragement and perspective can save a life. And there's a second piece of essential equipment that Jesus learned about during his 40 days in the wilderness that I'd like to mention. And that was Holy Scripture the word of God. Anytime you wander in the wilderness, the greatest threat to survival is disorientation, not knowing where you are or where to go. Most smart hikers and backpackers would only travel with a compass in hand. A compass is an essential piece of equipment. For the Lord, that guiding compass was scripture. The word of God that he had learned throughout his life and helped him in his heart. He held it deep so that when the devil offered him temptation, it was the scripture that he could turn to as a bearing point of his response. It was the core of his soul. It was his guiding light. His north star. In a world where the turn of events is constantly disorienting us. Scripture is perhaps the only means for keeping track of where we are. The two together form a sort of GPS for the Christian life. That's why regular participation in the church worships life, to hear the word of God expressed through prayer and sacrament, is so essential to our survival as human beings. It keeps us centered where the landscape of life becomes bizarre, alien, and unrecognizable. Frankly, I don't know how people face the wilderness without such a compass. I know one thing for certain, I can't. I rely heavily on receiving those weekly bearing points. Otherwise, I get lost quickly. Thank God for the waypoints of my life. Many of them are you. One must consider that there are people in the world who are perishing in their living rooms because they don't have any way to take a bearing. This morning, as we stand on the threshold of Lent, We are offered a chance for a new beginning. We are granted an opportunity to prepare our survival kits for this season and all the following seasons. I pray that you will remember the importance of having relationships that God has given you to rely on when things become difficult, to rely on one another. I pray that you will remember that scripture and prayer are your compass your navigational equipment for finding the way through. And 
And I pray that you will remember who went into the wilderness on your behalf, even at the cross, never giving in to evil, never forsaking his love for you or for God. Because if you can help keep all those things in your heart, you will have nothing to fear the next time you find yourself wandering in the wilderness of your living room. Welcome to Lent.